second digital talk of the Design um, and Democracy series, and a especially warm welcome to the participants of the Design Campus Summer School 2021. My name is Amelie Klein. I am a design curator, and together with my colleague Vera Zacchetti, who is also on the screen somewhere, um, I curated the summer school. So um, the Design Campus is a cur curatorial-driven, interdisciplinary, and future-oriented platform for rethinking some of the most pressing questions of our times through the lens of design. Um, it was launched this summer at the Dresden Kunstgewerbe Museum at Pilnitz, Pilnitz Palace and Park uh, with the summer school. So a six week long series of workshops um, that this talk tonight is um, um, part of. So um, Veda and I dedicated the inaugural summer school to design and democracy. Why? Because one, we think that design and its current crisis are arguably one of the most urgent issues of our times. And then two, because we think that design is an important and very worthwhile starting point for an analysis and discussion about this crisis. Um, the summer school started on July 18, so we're in week three, and it will continue until August 28. And this week, the Design Campus Summer School explores issues of choice and empowerment, seeking to understand who gets to choose and why. Um, is it possible to design participation, for example, and uh, equal access to voting? Um, and um, so let me now please uh, turn over the mic to Vera Zacchetti, who will introduce our amazing speaker for tonight's lecture, uh, who will tell you more about these questions and these issues of um, designing participation and voting and election and so on. And um, also Vera will explain why we were so keen to get Alicia to talk to us tonight. Hi everybody um, and welcome. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Alicia for being with us. We're very excited to have you here. So um, as Emily was saying, the lecture series that you are watching today was curated um, in an effort to complement and go a little bit more in depth on the topics that we've been articulating the workshops of the summer school uh, around. And Alicia um, is the author of a fantastic book that both Amelie and I treasure uh, as part of our research that led to the what is the design uh, campus design democracy uh, summer school this year uh, titled This is what. Um, no, sorry, I'm just saying the title of your lecture now. Um, basically, I wrote a book about the design of the voting ballot. And for Amelie and I, these kinds of devices, the voting ballot, are absolutely essential devices for people to be able to participate in democratic processes. And something very simple, such as the democratic ballot or the, the election ballot, in fact, is something that is absolutely essential for us to be able to, to exercise our right to vote, for example. But first, first, from something very, very simple, we can derive a lot of very complex narratives. And I think Alicia's book was something that really digs deeper into that. And I hope that, uh, and I think Alicia will also be speaking about this tonight. Um, so choice and empowerment, they also start on the design of something very simple, which is just a piece of a design, a design object, but it's also hiding a lot of different complex um, stories. Um, but uh, I will let Alicia speak about this and uh, we will also be with you, Alicia, at the end um, for the Q&A after the, the conversation, which is being li live streamed on YouTube. Um, and people can submit their questions uh, through the chat on YouTube. Uh, Amelie and I have a lot of questions as well, but we will be asking them after Alicia's talk. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Alicia. Uh, Chang, she's a founding partner of MGMT, and she's currently holding the dream job of head of design at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, from where she is talking to us. Uh, she has been a senior designer for Method in New York, and she was the co-design director at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Had I chosen a different career path, these would be pretty much the best jobs I could ever hope for. So very, very thrilled to be welcoming you here with us tonight and very, very thrilled to listen to what you have to say. 
Um, Alicia is not only a working designer, she has also taught and she has served as a visiting critic at Yale University, Princeton, Maryland Institute College of Art, the MICA, and Cooper Union School of Art. She is currently external critic for uh, the MFA program at RISD, and she's also somebody that is quite familiar with the tutors of the summer school that we have this week. So I think for them in Pilnitz uh, on the, in the outskirts of Dresden, it must be a pleasure to see Alicia speak today. But we will talk more about that later. Alicia, without further ado, apologies for the wind and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vera and Amelie. And I applaud you both for starting a, such an ambitious program with such a global reach, with such critical issues under these conditions. So, you know, kudos to you and Amelie for organizing and to all the participants as well for, you know, showing up or trying to show up. An incredible volume of challenges face us all these days. So I appreciate um, both the organization of the structure of this new program, but also the invitation to speak um, and also applaud you on your selection of uh, faculty members you have on site there now. Um, I also want to start with an apology for not being able to understand how time zones work so much. So I, I know that I've kept you in, uh, waiting for an hour, but hope you were able to enjoy the nice outdoors and the grounds uh, while you were waiting for me to get my stuff together. So uh, without further ado, I will jump in and Confirm that you can see my screen as a full slide. I'll just uh, assume you can. Um, so I will just begin. And indeed, as Vera had said, this talk is about a book that I um, recently completed. I think it came out in uh, May of last summer called This is What Democracy Looked Like. And I wanted to bring you into sort of the beginning of how I sort of conceived of this as uh, sort of initially just really like a research sort of side gig, but it was really inspired by an article in the New Yorker that I read in 2008 uh, by Jill Lepore called Rock, Paper, Scissors, How We Used to Vote. And the article, you know, was very <clears throat> wide ranging in terms of articulating early voting practices in colonial or post-colonial America. But one or two lines that she wrote about was how the ballots were brightly colored. And that alone was enough for me to sort of naively reach out to her. Um, at the time of 2008, I guess she was more available uh, for those kinds of emails, but she was incredibly generous with her time and met with me to sort of discuss uh, what actual phys physical ballots existed. So she tuned me into some different uh, libraries. There wasn't a lot. It was really based on individual collections, but that began the sort of search recreationally for uh, different ballot examples. Because to me, this is what I knew of as the ballot. You know, very boring, very bureaucratic, but you know, you recognize it as designers as the most direct tool of participatory democracy. Literally, it is the, the piece of paper that you articulate your opinion. So it's really how we express ourselves as citizens and also a direct reflection of the uneven evolution of our democracy, which I learned when I dug deeper into its own history. So this past year has been you know, singular in every way. Um, and also it forced an examination through the lens of the ballot into the history of our participatory democracy and how it's not just sort of like a, a trajectory gradually forward, but one historian called it a checkered tale of motion forward, backward and sideways. So this talk can help illustrate how the ballot was not only used as um, the representation of a citizen's voice, but also as a tool of the parties to exercise power and control. So if to me the ballots looked like this, uh, you may not, not also know that a ballot would also look like this back in 1864, or this example from 1878, this example from 1865, and then this one from 1870. So, you know, it has also been reflected in the nature of the election year that um, we've had in the states. Uh, so I put this in as a reminder of what it has become. But remember what it was like before times was more, you know, a very dull and uneventful process. You're marking your ballot at a sort of rickety table for privacy. You know, you get a sticker in our world and it's uh, relatively smooth in terms of how that process can go. But in order to look at the ballot, I realized that I also need to look at the process by which the ballot was um, submitted. 
So looking at the early days of our republic, which is very young and a relative scale to Europe, voting really looked more like this. So this is a painting by George Caleb Bingham from 1854. But it really can illustrate how the typical voter back then was, you know, white and male and land owning. And you would go to, say, a schoolhouse or <clears throat> a local pub and know everybody there. Um, you might enjoy a glass of like free whiskey, which he's enjoying in the corner there to help guide your choice. And then you would really be asked to um, vote by declaring your preference out loud. And oftentimes the candidate would be there in person to stand up and thank you for your vote. Uh, and the system was called viva voce, uh, you know, used by the Greeks before paper, along with other simple methods like raising your hand, as we remember from grade school, or even stories about uh, voters lining up on opposite sides of the room, as they do in certain Iowa caucuses now. Um, so you realize that the scale of sort of soliciting what the public opinion is it can be quite simple and quite uh, based on sort of physical presence. Uh, which worked very fine for classrooms or small communities. But as America grew, the scale became much, much harder to manage. So that's just sort of the, the sort of background. To some degree, we'll revisit that process by uh, the active voting. But now let's look at some ballots. So the meat of what I'm showing today is basically like a 70 year span or so between 1820s up to the turn of the century. It wasn't an exhaustive timeline per se. It wasn't necessarily my intent to sort of fill in the blanks with each year. In a way, it kind of gave myself the curatorial freedom to sort of pick the cool examples uh, and then sort of piece them together in a chronological way. Um, so let's start with this one from 1827. We should be remembered, we should be reminded that ballots really by their nature shouldn't exist. Um, they're actually legally required to be destroyed. And those that survived are called by many collectors as the most fugitive ephemera, which I kind of love that phrase, the idea that ephemera is sort of elusive and skirting around dark corners. Um, but you know, they're meant to be destroyed for security reasons. And back then in the early 1800s, you weren't necessarily given an official ballot printed by the government to mark your choice. You may have filled in a piece of paper that might have looked like this from 1827, where the office was printed, but the voter would hand write their preferences in. Or potentially you were handed a bunch of smaller ballots like these, which were pre-printed for the voter to submit. Uh, these are the offices on one side with the names on the back. Um, and again, just going back to the process by which votes, the ballots were distributed, there again were no government issued ballots and no regulations about how they should be produced. So imagine, you know, our country is growing by leaps and bounds, immigration is taking off, and it was easier for the states and the growing municipalities to have the parties print their own ballots and pay for their own production and distribution. It was too much for uh, any uh, like early nascent state governments to oversee. But imagine now it seems insane to us to give that amount of power and control to the political parties. Um, but that's the situation back in the you know, early turn of the century. So you also didn't know who you were necessarily voting for insofar that all the candidates were listed as what they would call a straight ticket. There was no possibility for you to vote for one candidate from one party and another from an, uh, another different party. It was really party affiliation exclusively and you were given the docket of names uh, when you approach the ballot um, site, uh, the voting site as a polling site as you see here. People offering also the free whiskey is sort of a consistent theme. Um, so just to say that sort of free-for-all was a heyday for printers who were left to their own devices to typeset the ballots. So here are some examples from the 1870s where you can see the variety between tickets in terms of the regular Republican and regular Democratic ticket. Um, you know, in a way it also dovetails with sort of more ornamental uh, Victorian aspect of sort of the aesthetics of the time. But we'll go into more about how um, consistencies of sort of party recognition came to evolve as well, all through the printed ephemera. So lots of ballots then also started having emblems or signifiers at the top of them. They were used both as a party brand, if you will, but also as a device to help less literate voters. Keep in mind that we assume that today's voting uh, you know, goes without saying that people understand what they're reading, but back then that was uh, you know, not the case at all. And it was easier for people to distribute uh, ballots and say vote for the ship versus like the Dr. Seuss-like tree in the middle. Um, you know, ballots were also used as sort of uh, 
objects of propaganda and had more blatant messaging on them. These two temperance ballads from the 1870s depicted the evils of drink in the form of fathers coming home from, to their families. And one um, on the right says, out of the grog shops come woe, misery, and death. Um, so as a note of caution. And other ballots for our eyeballs, uh, these are quite shocking, but here are examples of ballots for parties that are based explicitly on anti-immigration or anti-Chinese platforms, you know, calling for protection of white labor or, you know, property qualification for colored men. Um, you know, that was really what parties were often formed on in terms of their planks. Here's one of my favorite examples for a candidate named C.C. O'Donnell, who was president of the Anti-Cooley Club in San Francisco. His uh, campaign promise was to run out all Chinese within the first 24 hours of gaining office. Um, and I know this crowd as designers will appreciate the irony of the header typeset and what I was calling early chopsticks. So there's some good irony there. So while ballots were given out to voters with no need to make any selections, not everyone was playing by those rules. Um, you know, we are Americans. Um, so you start seeing examples of voters using the ballot as a direct form of expression, which we take for granted now, but they also were using it as a tool for protest. Um, so this is a good example from Mississippi, a few years after Lincoln was assassinated and during the short period of reconstruction. Um, you can see how he put a line through every option of the ballot, it was definitely a he. Um, you could see that the write-in area in today's American ballot, uh, where there's a space usually at the end um, of the list where you can just say write-in candidate. To me, it was always a weird kind of artifact and I wondered why. I wonder if it was sort of an artifact looking at this example um, as an area of protest where, you know, it's the demand by the voter and the public to have an area for free expression. So we can talk about this more later, but it sort of reinforces the idea that the ballot, especially uh, the way that Americans use it, is a way of sending a direct message to the government. And in this way, you're really actually like penning a note to your official who's reading it. Um, so these are another great example of sort of seeing the hand of the voter back then, which was also a very eerie feeling when you're researching and sort of seeing these artifacts in person, sort of physicality and the tactility of it was really quite uh, amazing and magical and freaky. Um, so these are good examples of marked ballots. So the number of offices are growing at the, in our country at this time in 1888, this one is from. Um, but so the number of candidates also grew, which required the voter to really indicate their selections from a long list. So these are examples of what they are called scratched ballots, which, you know, sort of related to how if hanging chats were confusing, election rules really varied from state to state, municipality to municipality. So sometimes you put a line through the person you didn't want, or sometimes you put a line through the person you did want. So you had to really pay attention uh, to the rules put before you. Um, so vandalizing your own ballot was one thing, but there's other modifications that candidates could use to get their name on the ballot if it didn't make it on the printed piece. So one common tactic, and I was finding this is a very rare example of them being assembled, were these small slips of paper called pasters. So they're teeny tiny, they're sort of like much smaller than a fortune cookie, and they have gummed adhesive on the back. And these were sent to voters or made available at the polls with like actual glue pots where you could actually slip, take one off and put them in the area of office that you wanted to vote for Gustav Erdhardt or James Martin. So here are some examples of some, what I call literally manhandled uh, ballots that were cut and pasted and worked over. You can see it just, hey, it's like a craft project in terms of how to get the ticket to look like what who you wanted to vote for. So the sort of excising, the adding on, the gluing, um, it really was a piece of work. So seeing these pasters applied to the ballots were one thing. And then I came across this ballot from 1870, which you can see it sort of reads as sort of a standard letterpress type set thing. But then the question was why was Edward Flattery's name so bizarre and clearly like hand drawn and a litho stone, like, you know, out of everything else being much more straightforward. But it seems like when you put these two facts together that not only was typesetting on a curve unusual and not so easy to do, but that design decision kind of serves as a typographic like countermeasure for any efforts to write or paste over the name. You can see Laverius could work in this situation, but it probably wouldn't work for Nehemiah Gibson. Um, so this is incredibly dense 
a version of a ballot from 1864, lithographically printed, jam-packed of all the presidential electors down to the sheriff in the corner. But yeah, there's no way you're fitting any add-on notes into this um, incredibly dense design um, in a way that can be seen as sort of a defensive measure. So the other thing to keep in mind when looking at ballots is how these were actually produced. Um, you know, keep in mind 1800s in America, the time of the Industrial Revolution, steam power, railroad system, it was all happening here. And this also affected printing production and distribution, which are still things that we consider with every design piece that anyone produces. So a combination of faster and cheaper methods of printing started to evolve. There were broader distribution networks because of the railroad, a growing population with more time on their hands because they weren't farming all the time as much and plenty of politics for entertainment. So printers were also eager to show up new printing techniques and combinations. And so here's a beautiful example of an engraved uh, ballot from Virginia. And also these uh, ballots showing uh, different ways where colored inks were starting to be used more prevalently because of innovations of petroleum processing at the time. So new chemical formulas allowed the inks to be more vibrant, but also more stable. So you get a whole variety of hues produced. So all of these things I never thought would be attached to looking at the ballot as a whole. But in terms of the questions of how does this look this way, um, these aspects of production and distribution and uh, you know, um, people getting more literate were all factors in what these ballots really looked like. Um, the other factor from a production standpoint is paper went from being produced from rags, which became in short supply, especially uh, post Civil War, to being made from wood pulp, which was much more plentiful at the time, uh, less so now, obviously. But those kind of innovations allowed for further um, distribution and methodologies that, you know, produces ballads like this on beautiful colored stock. But I would say too, that recognizing that this isn't just for aesthetic reasons, you know, these were meant to also be really distinctive, calling back to the uh, earlier cartoon showing the sort of, you know, the carnival um, that happens on election day, but it would be much more distinctive to see a voter submit a bright yellow ballot after you've given it to him versus, um, you know, just making sure that the, the money you may have given that voter was going in the right place. Um, these I just include just because from a design standpoint, this gang sheet, which will probably be cut up and distributed at the polls. I really enjoy the different kind of typographic explorations that were happening on this one sheet. Um, and this one, which was a amazing scrapbook that I found in San Francisco Historical Society that was just encrusted with all of these um, ballots sort of glued on top of each other, which was incredibly amazing, and incredibly frustrating uh, in terms of how they could be photographed. So it was uh, layered in this fashion. And those are all backs, which is a whole separate category I'm going to get to in a second. Um, but just sort of witnessing this sort of aspect of physical history in your hand, I can't underscore how thrilling it was. Um, this is another good example of lithographic printing with hand lettering uh, in two colorways. And the sort of yellow is the second color. It was hard to say for sure, but the complexity could also be seen as that deterrent to counterfeiters. So different parties would try to fool voters in terms of emulating their design. Um, this is another hilarious example I find of sort of letterpress gone totally wild. Um, you know, nothing is more uh, painful looking than letterpress on a curve. Uh, and these next few are pretty spectacular in that way. Um, these really blew my mind. They're from 1878. So it's a multicolor print that likely used a chromatic press, but it's unusually precise if you just really examine the, um, the transition of the hues. So which doesn't make it a sort of split fountain technique. You know, it probably would have been maybe a test print, I can only imagine, because why go through all this effort to produce something that would likely be thrown away? Um, but these are all open mysteries. And what I loved about this project too, is that I could bring a lot of these examples uh, to existing letterpress uh, printers and ask them what that they could theorize on the pro uh, production methods, which we're still doing today. So that continuity of the historical arc was really nice for me. This is um, uh, also a really crazy example of um, a tapeworm ballot. And this is about sort of, I keep using the fortune cookies to paste one for size, but this is sort of like a larger size slip of paper where they fit, I think it was 26 candidates on there in a teeny way. Again, there's no way you're gonna write in uh, your own candidate preferred by hand, et cetera. And the, the more notable thing about these two ballots was that they were able to do it for like three sequential elections before uh, an election board stepped in and finally said, you know, enough's enough. So we need to have some regulations with these formats. 
Um, so I alluded to the backs through that, um, the, uh, the scrapbook, but uh, the backs were also, uh, there was party on there with if you had business in the front. So, you know, it's also using up all the available real estate. So making the backs equally distinctive was a way to sort of mark uh, your party. So the front and backs here and some of these lovely backs um, for the Adams ticket from Boston, so Norfolk as the county, just sort of uh, beautiful, just objects in and of themselves. I just include for our own um, design enjoyment, uh, and as well as this one. So political parties is another topic that has to be addressed when we're looking at all these different ballots, because you're thinking in our American terms of really the two party system, knowing there were other parties in the past, but you know, what I realized that going even further back, there were even more parties. So that's why I call it the political party party. Um, this is a diagram from the Smithsonian showing the rise and fall of political parties from 1789 to 1860. So you see the original Federalists and then there were once Republican Democrats, which then get integrated into Republicans and the splinter groups of the Free Stoilers, the Native American, the Liberty League. It's like a whole bowl of political spaghetti at the end, which makes a sort of simplicity of uh, the Democrat Republican two party system. Um, something you think that really doesn't necessarily fully re resemble um, our country as a whole and this kind of timeline this attempt to track it, I think is really telling. Um, but so just as an extension of that, you didn't just have those two, you had the People's Party, you had something called the Cactus Ticket, you had the Argonaut Ticket, I mean, these were all over the place and just amazing to see the whole, the array. Um, so massive proliferation as well as splinter groups, but basically the, the takeaways that anyone could really print up a ballot and have a ticket that represented their party. So again, I keep reiterating this framework because I think sometimes it's, it's a bit lost in the assumption that what our practice today um, of voting needs to be contextualized in the history. So, you know, lots of voters coming online, lots of parties, lots of elections, uh, you know, a fair bit of corruption and fisticuffs, which were often... You know, I read a lot of accounts of it being staged deliberately to deter, um, you know, less stalwart voters in terms of, um, you know, the violence that could incur on election days. So this is an image from Harper's um, from the 1850s. You know, not to paint too lurid a picture, but this is also the time of Boss Tweed where you had that sort of gangs in New York kind of um, vibe and, you know, immigrants were naturalized en masse and then walked directly to the polls. Some of the more extreme uh, stories I enjoyed reading about were um, something called voting by whiskers where you could get five votes out of one man if he started the day with a beard and ended it clean shaven. So you can sort of do that se sequencing in your head. Anyway, just to say things were getting kind of nuts. And so calls for reform started happening around like the late 1860s or so. So enter the Australian ballot, um, which was actually first adopted in Tasmania. So it really should be called the Tasmanian ballot. Um, in 1859. But here's the big deal about this new format. So first of all, it was produced and distributed by the government, which made it official. So seeing everything that I showed before, that was kind of a radical act. Also, all candidate choices were consolidated onto one ballot. So each party no longer printed their own ticket, which was also a huge shift. But the biggest thing, I think the one that I think Americans take for granted, is that this ballot was meant to be cast in secret. All of this before was all public record, public display, community articulation. Like it was really, there was no hiding your affiliation. And, and originally um, there, there was no the quotes where people calling it a cowardly act to sort of hide your ballot choice. So many obviously parties were up in arms and concerned that consolidating the voters, uh, the offices would vex the voter, but it also resulted in some radically different looking ballots. So this is an example of what the new at the time blanket ballot format was in the 1900s. So, you know, they were concerned about voter fatigue, which you totally get because this is a crazy amount of people. But note that you can finally vote for somebody in the Democratic Party as well as the Socialist Labor Party. So that was an advantage. But what also happened was that it went from a public act to private. And in doing that, as well as the challenge of legibility for this, the voter participation really precipitously dropped when this format was introduced. So not only do you need a high level of patience, uh, knowledge of each candidate and also literacy, 
um, all those expectations really winnowed down at the voting pool and to some degree on purpose um, for the parties who implemented it. So Massachusetts was the first to adopt it in 1888 and the other states gradually used the system. You would think that of course everyone would embrace it but it took until 1908, which is really quite um, a long time uh, when Taft was elected president. So we've really been only using our secret ballot system uh, for only a little over what, a hundred years. And you know, America's a young country, but that's crazy. So variations on the layout of course began to emerge quite immediately. This one from 1906 is grouped by office, so you can still vote for the straight party as well as individuals. Um, and then this one from 1896 for New Hampshire, which I love the sort of introduction still, the sort of filler dingbats that are starting to happen um, where you're trying to encourage people to just vote for with one X. So it's still working out uh, typographic tricks of the trade within this um, piece of ephemera, as well as sort of the nice way that they're fitting in a longer city name within the names of the candidates. Uh, here's a ballot that's organized by office, but you also start seeing these tiny emblems next to the names. And you know those who are affiliated with more than one party uh, represent obviously a safe, safe challenge for especially someone like Ogden Mills in the upper right there. Um, this one is uses sort of an, a rather enigmatic geometric system showing party affiliations and how some candidates represented more than one party. Um, and then emblems then really started to establish themselves as a way to really identify your party and vote the straight tickets. So, you know, you see common emblems like socialist labor is always the sort of arm with a hammer. Um, Democratic Party reform was often a ship, et cetera. Um, prohibition was, you know, the fountain. Uh, but one critic saw these as an insult to the voter saying, there can be no improvement in government as long as voters cast their ballots for birds instead of men. Um, so everyone's a critic. Uh, things got really absurd when I came across this New York state ballot from 1912. It measures 14 feet long and has nearly 600 names organized by state and district committees. So this was, uh, no one could also offer any theories about how this ballot exists. It seems like, you know, it was sort of a demonstrable sort of, um, uh, assertion that the system needed to change uh, and then not to say this ballot, but in, during this period of 1915, 1912, reform measures were more actively called for and there was something called the short ballot movement in response. So this is the moment where the timeline kind of starts galloping uh, over big chunks of time because in the late 1800s, again, recalling the level of innovation that was happening technologically, there was the telephone, the light bulb, the automobile, so there was a huge zeal for the machine and a faith in technology. So with all the talk of fraud, machines were hailed as the perfect solution to protect against that since they eliminated the need for unreliable and potentially dishonest human vote and human vote counters. So and I'm sure that all sounds familiar. Um, this is a patent drawing for an Myers automatic voting booth in 1889, which uses a lever system. These things were massive and heavy and expensive and um, highly prone to failure. So all of those elements I'm sure also sounds quite familiar, but just to say we've been on, down this road before. Um, other reform movements were examining what accessible mark making uh, would be uh, in terms of this 1913 progressive party booklet that analyzed um, what qualifies as a legal mark. So again, the continuing theme of uh, paper as a sort of reliable way to sort of submit your vote, but also ensuring the legibility um, of voter intent and maintaining the articulation of voter intent is something that is uh, prevalent throughout the, the whole era we're looking at now. So in the interest of time, I'm basically skipping over the entire 20th century um, because, you know, it's fine. It's just not half as amazing as the first half. Um, but I have to end on the infamous butterfly ballot, which to Americans is really a, you know, sort of seminal um, symbol of, uh, you know, voter um, misintent, I would say. Uh, this is a punch card, which uses the yellow strip in the center, and you can see the stylus in blue is used to punch out the hole. So voters who wanted to vote for Al Gore, if you see, you know, arrow number five, they often would find themselves voting for arrow number four, because it was the second uh, group listing on that. So, you know, we can go into more of the design itself of the ballot, you know, this 
this format needed to be two columns because of the number of people on there. Like there's reasons why not to defend, but you know, the brief I would say was a challenge and the format too. But in terms of how that exhibited itself and like massive um, user failure, it's another, um, you know, good uh, lesson for us all as designers. But uh, just going back to the ballot then, we're, I was also just reiterating the themes of that the ballots now are still confusing. They're still hard to mark. Uh, and there's still aspects clearly of voter suppression, electoral fraud, and undermining our faith in the integrity of the system. So in a way, the timing of this book with the general election fervor uh, was I think useful, I hope, for those who can fully appreciate the context at which we were operating from and to maybe appreciate how boring the ballot really is and the process by which we cast it you know, it's not fraught with uh, the threat of bodily harm. Uh, and those kind of wins, I think, are have been maybe long forgotten. Um, so I'm just reminding us to herald this very boring um, sample of our current voting practices in states uh, and to sort of seeing it maybe in a potentially new light. So I'll end by um, saying that Cooper Union was super gracious to um, provide an exhibition space that was able to be in the foundation building, if you guys know it, in New York, down in Astor Place. Uh, and it was a series of windows that were perfectly proportioned for ballots, which was very nice. And this went up in October. Um, and it was great to sort of have it be also public facing and not indoors at the time. Um, but this was a great moment for me to sort of have the satisfaction of seeing these uh, produced in a really large scale. Um, which also revealed some aspects of doodles that I hadn't seen um, because it was blown up so large. So I'll just end on that environmental note and as a shameless pitch for my book, uh, this is what the book looks like. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, Amazon is not necessarily necessary evil, but I would encourage everyone if it's possible through European distribution to go through bookshop.org, which represents um, more independent bookstores. Um, so. That's the end of the talk, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alicia. And um, thank you for, first of all, this absolutely incredible, incredibly rich visual amount of stimulus. Like for me, having studied graphic design, this is absolutely paradise to be able to encounter these incredible examples. And I'm sure for you, you must have, I mean, as you said, it must have seemed like such a treasure trove to find and encounter these things, these different printing techniques, absolutely wonderful. Um, I would like to open up the Q&A by inviting people that are watching to submit their questions over in the chat. We will get them here and we can ask them directly to Alicia. Um, but before we get to those questions and so that you have time to actually insert them in the, in the chat. Um, I would like to ask with a couple of questions um, that I have, and maybe Emily also has a couple. Um, I am of course very struck um, by the, let's say, uh, abundance of political parties and uh, different groups of people that maybe self-organized mm -hmm. uh, and had, uh, let's say, a, a seat at the table of American uh, democracy or mm -hmm. American government. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, you, you showed this absolutely incredible diagram, which kind of leads us through the formation of what is today a, a mostly two-party system um, in the U.S. Um, and I'm wondering if when you were researching this abundance, if you found parties that perhaps use different strategies to communicate and to sort of um, find their way to a seat at the table uh, and that were maybe uh, falling out of the demographic of this sort of white male demographic that you alluded to at the very beginning of your talk. Mm. I know the question, the answer I would like to give is yes, I, you know, that I found a whole undercurrent of, uh, you know, underrepresented groups that were sort of organizing themselves and representing themselves. I did not. <laughs> what I found was really quite the opposite, where parties were explicitly organized on platforms that were like the whole, there was a lot more anti-Chinese parties uh, that I could have shown. And that, you know, to our mind is, you know, obviously shocking. But that became a clear identifier for how groups got together in terms of, you know, anti-immigration, broadly speaking, uh, and also more pointedly, especially in San Francisco and California, you know, anti-Chinese. So to me, it was a rather dispiriting reminder that sort of exclusionary attitudes 
are part of the foundation of, of our country too, as well as sort of the most expansive inclusive aspect too. But it's always been a tension that has had much more acute um, moments, uh, not, to, not to excuse anything that's happening now, but just that they, it was like far, far worse in a weird way. Um, so I would just say that's the broader answer to that, that observation and, and question. But did the, <clears throat> I mean, at some point, the, um, the structure of the voting population changed, right? Mm -hmm. so with women being allowed to vote with, um, um, yeah, uh, as you said, you know, immigrants being allowed to vote and, and being naturalized, etc. cetera. Um, did, did this uh, changing pop population reflect somehow uh, in the design of the ballots, was there some reference or did you notice, ah, this is when women come in or this is when whoever comes in? You know, the, you know, the 19th Amendment, we just had this anniversary, it's from 1920. That is so late. Uh, so the, that moment of sort of how those demographic shifts affected how the look of the ballot were less obvious in that regard, what was more obvious was sort of the machinations of the different parties in terms of the shifts from, you know, the radical shift to the Australian format in terms of consolidating them and, and efforts to regulate. And then seeing the response of different states to sort of work around the regulations in terms of like, you know, paper color being like pink versus, you know, off white and sort of, you know, it, I mean, there's a whole book actually. I mean, we would probably as designers enjoy reading it. I did, but it's like production specifications in terms of the paper weight and color, et cetera. Like they were trying to really hammer out any loopholes that everyone was trying to sort of strategize, sort of get around and give any advantage to their party. So just to say that it, it really focused the attention on sort of evolving and ongoing power of all these political parties. Um, within each other so that the voting demographic and that what they're trying to capture is really just aspects of the vote and they would get it without the voter or not. And that was the other aspect that was really um, a common theme in terms of what I discovered for the nature of how the, the shifts in the format reflected other political shifts or, you know, from a production and distribution standpoint, those were also big shifts that I felt really informed the look of the ballot too. I mean, I, I really um, am curious about the, the fact that even after all this time, there still isn't a kind of, you know, even despite the fact that that uh, that the U.S. has sort of implemented the Australian ballot system, there isn't still, let's say, a consistency in the design of ballots. It's just really something that's completely um every year that you have an election, things change, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that is, is quite striking to me, you know, that every state can have their own ballot, every different election have their own ballot. And this is not just in the US, it's kind of everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about this consistent, not non-consistence that exists? Yeah, I mean, as designers, we like a system and we like a consistent system. And so it has been posed to me of like, you know, why can't the US implement some universal ballot? It makes sense as a question, <laughs> but in operation, excuse me, you know, you have so many, each municipality and what is on that ticket is different from the next one and the propositions that are voted on, et cetera. So the expansiveness of what we're asking each voter to metabolize, you know, is specific to each jurisdiction such that having a universal ballot is actually not feasible. Plus let's not sort of discount the fact that our independent spirit will also you know, promote more sort of interpretive individualistic aspects of each jurisdiction. So there is that history that really speaks to um, what looks like a rather chaotic array of everyone kind of doing their own thing, such that I find that it's framed my own understanding of having a universal process by which we all go to the polls on one allotted day and the size of our country is kind of a miracle. So I'm not looking to rest on those laurels, but it is quite amazing how well the whole flotilla does function. Um, so, I mean, there are great examples happening in say Portland where there actually has been an AIGA initiative to insert a graphic designer in that process. LA is a good example too. So there are brighter hopes for going forward, but in terms of that transference and um, its ability to be applicable to you know, a nationwide adaptation, 
you know, you can't even get everybody to wear masks. So um, not to give up on that, but just to say that there's, it's, a, it's far more complex in its um, implementation. I have another question. Um, you spoke about uh, the Australian ballot and system. Does that mean that, so, and you said it was in introduced in Tasmania first. Uh, so mm -hmm. did you look at other um, examples of, of, of ballots elsewhere in the world, maybe in Europe even? I would say that would be volume two because I did look at that over that edge and I was like, I can't go there right now because it was already so much to unpack with the American ballot. But I, I found it so fascinating that this talk and, and having given it not just to designers, but also the researchers or um, you know advocacy groups for voter rights or, I mean, it's been really interesting how, inter how well received it's been, but also the different demographics that I speak to. Um, such that I've been getting a lot of other examples of, you know, ballots in India, ballots in France, and uh, a more expansive, you know, deep dive into Brazilian politics, et cetera. But, you know, with each one of those um, examples, you have to then examine the system by which it is representing the process by which the voters submit their votes too. So it's inherently complex, but I'm game to try it. So anytime I get some a free moment to start that other research um, project anew, I will definitely um, expand the scope to be more international. Thank you, Alicia. Mm -hmm. um, I think I will um, ask a last question and then I will end, uh, we will end this, this, this lecture on that note. Um, that the, the the other question that the question that I would like to ask to sort of wrap up the discussion really connects to everything else that is around the ballot because of course the ballot is something physical is is, is an artifact that you can analyze that you can print that you can collect even if you're not supposed to because it's supposed to disappear um, but it's something that is just what remains of this whole process of getting people to show up on one day to vote it's uh, what remains of all these stories of voter suppression that we keep reading about um, and all of this kind of community um, work that goes around getting people to actually believe that they want to participate in the elections and so on. Um, and really, it also is something that talks about the fact that people do not believe uh, in democratic processes anymore and can't be bothered to actually go and vote and go to the polls and wait in line and so on. And I was wondering if in your research and perhaps just as your own opinion, what is your feeling about this? I mean, I, I feel like you, you, you talked in your talk about this idea that um, participation suffered a significant drop when ballots became quite complex to read and required a certain kind of literacy that maybe uh -huh. somebody that was sort of could sort of shave uh, their facial hair in different ways to, to be able to vote did not really engage with. Um, but I was wondering if, if you have a comment on, 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 on all those other layers that, that are sort of it, immaterial, that you cannot see. And if you see mm -hmm. sort of echoes of, 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 of the past in, in what we are seeing now today, I mean, right now in U.S. politics continues to be a huge issue, this idea of voter suppression and how people are not able to, be, to, to vote, while on the other hand, you have people that just don't want to vote and don't want to be mm -hmm. bothered. So I was wondering if those echoes of the past can inform the way that you look at these issues right now mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, I mean, it is all tied together. And that's why the whole journey of the research is, you know, it began innocently, maybe as sort of an examination of this printed ballot through a design lens, and it turned into this incredibly complex overlapping Venn diagram of all these different component factors and the context that then resulted still in the ballot being the sort of epicenter as the tool of participatory democracy. But within that, you know, aspects to sort of restore the integrity of the vote was something that was repeated, you know, during all these sort of tumultuous uh, responses to the rampant fraud too, such that, you know, ballot boxes are another kind of side digression I could have included, where at one point they were promoting a glass uh, uh, jar, sort of like it looks like a fishbowl, and it was encased in sort of like an iron kind of box. But the idea is that you would roll up your ballot and then uh, put it in the top, but sort of that would reflect the transparency of the vote. 
because there was tampering with the box itself. So efforts have always been there to sort of restore the integrity, maintain the integrity, reassure the voter that their vote was going to count. But incentivizing has always been an issue. There's a reason why there's whiskey in every cartoon, you know, in terms of getting people out there. Um, so I think it, to me, it sort of spoke, and I don't want to end on sort of a downer note because uh, there are hopeful moments for sure, but human nature really has not changed so much in terms of that sort of uh, desire to sort of incentivize, follow through, and you know, satisfy those who really have that intent, um, but how easily it can be swayed and deterred. So the conditions by which we have, you know, no violence at the polls, and you know, you know, and those kind of aspects of sort of civility, I think, are indicators that we do actually have hope. There is more awareness fundamentally this year has shown. So I encourage everybody I meet, even though the process is flawed and messy and dispiriting to actually go through the training for the US elections. Like you can be a volunteer, you can learn how to you know, process people and distribute the votes. And it's frustrating and it's a long day, but you know, if you care about it uh, and the awareness is there, follow through and really help it um, you know, in an active way. So that's my general message to get out there for all those American designers out there who can look at the design um, and get upset about it. It's like the design is also the system. It's not just the object. So I know we need to wrap up and I've kept you guys up. So I'm terribly sorry about my uh, mistimed start, but hope you all um, enjoyed no it and have good fodder for discussion for your week on site. And I know Ramona and uh, Andrew will um, create a lot of fun tasks for you guys to do, fun and edifying. Definitely. I would maybe I'd like to end, or Emily, do you want to end with a shout out to our tutors on site? Um, I feel like we should... Give a shout out to Ramon Tejada and Andrew Sloat, who are the tutors of this week's uh, workshops at the Design Campus. I'll pass it on to Emily if she wants to say some concluding words. And thank you, Alicia, so much for your time today. My total pleasure. I don't have anything to add. And I'm very grateful for all of you who uh, watched and listened. And um, I would say, um, yeah, let's wrap up. And I'll have dinner and lunch maybe for you, Alicia. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Good luck with the week and have some fun. Thanks. Bye.